And so April 19 is the date. Took a while, you might argue too long, but the bubble with Australia is on. The Prime Minister's with us. Good morning. Good morning, Mike. Now, the MIQ situation, am I correct in reading that the magic 40% we were going to get by the freeing up of the bubble isn't as good as it might have once have been? Yeah, it's, uh, actually, I'm grateful for the chance to clarify this because what we're expecting is, is not to see an overall increase in numbers for high-risk travellers. Um, but what we did say yesterday, uh, we've got about a thousand, roughly a thousand spaces we think that will be freed up by the Trans Tasman arrangement. We're keeping about 500 in contingency uh, just to help us manage any potential issues with the Trans Tasman. That then leaves us uh, additional spaces. Now, some of the spaces that we've been using for Trans Tasman, Mike, were really only suitable for low risk countries. So some of our facilities uh, we don't think necessarily had the kind of specifications we'd want to use for higher risk travellers. For those facilities, we're looking at whether or not we can use them specifically for other low risk countries. Now that really just leaves the Pacific Islands. Exactly. So we RAC workers. A, and potentially it could for, for that. So we're spending just a little bit of time working that through and as I said yesterday, Minister Hipkin will be making some further announcements on that in fairly short What do you need to know? There's no COVID in the Pacific Islands. We're desperate for workers. Your plan didn't work in hiring locals. Get them in. No, no, pure, pure logistics. You know, how many spaces would we anticipate would, you know, from those particular facilities would be used, for instance, for our contingency? How many does that then leave us in our allocation? Uh, and then working uh, working with, you know, industry, there's you know, a range of different demands, the RSC being one of them. They're one of the few groups, keep in mind, Mike, that we did bring in 2,000 workers. Yeah, but support. it wasn't enough. Oh, and yes, we've certainly in some uh, industries I've said that for this season, certainly it would have taken a bit of pressure off that they'd been able to access further. Now we need to look to... But we can now. Here we go. Let's, let's do it. The grape growers and just this morning are saying a 1,000 short, easily a 1,000 short, in Marlborough alone. And as I've said, we've just made the announcement on the Trans-Tasman. Um, we have very explicitly said we're looking now straight to those other low-risk areas, and that's what we're doing. So When, when you say contingency, right what you're I mean, I understand why you're doing it, but essentially contingency means empty rooms, doesn't it? And we already have buffers um, because we've always needed that. A, we keep rooms aside for those who are part of our exemptions process, you know, if they've got compassionate reasons where they need to, to come in straight away or significant significant health reasons that people might need to access. We always keep a bit of contingency in case we have to close a facility. Uh, you know, we have to keep in mind, you know, we've had facilities in Wellington. If you had an earthquake, you need to move people quickly. So we've always had contingency. This will be adding to it. You, you we'll got, just, so just let me interrupt review. that. Just let, let me get you on the Wellington one. I mean, that's, that's a level of conservatism that's absurd in case you it's have not, a... Well, why don't you just move everyone out of Wellington just in case of an earthquake, it's not. It's not a. It's not a large amount, Mike. But you know, we've always we've and we've used that. So I don't think we should assume here that that contingency uh, has been uh, overly cautious and not useful. It has. That's the kind of thing that's allowed us to take offline facilities if we've ever had issues and not had to cancel people's placements. But this so goes back to the beginning. Well if you look us. at MB, MB have always cleared more facilities that you've never actually opened and never actually used. In other words, MIQ has never been the capacity it could have been in, a, in an economy that's been crippled. Marlborough alone, for example, this is beyond grapes, with their construction system next year, their um, Picton Ferry Terminal, uh, the Marlborough Colleges, the Somerset Retirement Villages, they're going to be 1,800 people short next year. And I'm just going to I'm just going to stop you there Mike. First of all, uh, we are amongst a very few countries in the world operating an MIQ system successfully. That means that we have exactly the opposite of what you claimed. Our economy has not been crippled for the very fact that we operate the system that we have. In fact, the issues that people have are workers' shortages because in many cases, of course, they have been able to generally continue to operate, and that is vastly different than other parts of the world. So some of these problems are created by the fact that we are open and we are operating. We are in recession, yes, of course, you realise. We of course, we of course have some limitations, uh, and no one is denying that. But you know, in many parts with horticulture, you'll hear them say that we've worked as we've worked closely together to try and overcome those issues. Yeah, but but you haven't, and that's the point. You haven't overcome them, and they are short, and they are being hurt badly to the tune of tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And it's something that I thought we could improve on with the bubble, and yet it turns out to be the exact opposite. 
Well, actually, no, I think we just had a discussion at the beginning of this interview that demonstrated we are. Well, uh, one well, of the I'm... things that hasn't been picked up is that we are looking to use those spaces for low-risk countries. And basically, the Pacific is it. There aren't really any others that are on that list. OK, not Taiwan? Oh, we, we don't have that huge demand coming in from there. But, of course, um, you know, permanent residents and citizens who may be based there are certainly able to come in. But I've, I've never seen a long list of people coming out of Taiwan trying to access MIQ. When do you think we will be allowing people into this country who have been vaccinated without going to MIQ? Yeah, so that we've really left that, Mike, an open question. And, and I think really the world is at the moment because we just Well, then, no, can I have... uh, just, they haven't. The CDC said over the weekend that Americans can travel vaccinated internationally and domestically. Singapore, as of next month, are accepting people so with... Just, uh, just to passports. pause on that. So America is starting to allow its citizens to travel. The UK, of course, Australia. Australia doesn't allow you to leave Australia unless you have a visa. We have never done that. New Zealanders can come and go regardless of whether or not they are vaccinated. We happen to use managed isolation facilities on their return. So you, the, United, the answer is you don't know when. Oh, no one, Mike, Mike, no one as yet, um, unfortunately, and we will soon, I'm sure, no one has yet definitive data that tells you that if you're vaccinated, uh, the degree to which you are still able to really pass on COVID. Because keeping in mind, the vaccine, what it does is make sure that you no, don't I, I get that. So significant. But as of next month, Singapore well, are allowing you to do that. I might not have heard that explanation, so I just was trying to be helpful, but sure. No, but next, um, month, next month you can go, if you're vaccinated, to Singapore and not go through MIQ. This is Singapore going to be the way of the now. world in the next month or two, and we need to have an answer for that, given we're so reliant on tourists. Mike, take a deep breath. And allow me to just set this out for you. The reason that New Zealand has been so successful is because we do not have COVID. Our goal with any vaccine passport, as would be for other parts of the world once they are in the same position as us, is to make sure they don't have outbreaks again. Until we are sure that vaccines are successful and effective in stopping you being able to pass on COVID to others, it won't necessarily stop outbreaks. Yep, I understand. And so that's why we're trying to transition. Now, Mike, as soon as that data comes through and gives us that reassurance, we can change our plans up. We don't have that data yet, which okay. is why we're running this system. Could part of the data be the problem? Have you read the Herald's piece on the trouble they're having with the Ministry of Health and the numbers around the vaccine rollout? Uh, well, I haven't read a specific article, but I'm happy to answer your questions. It's, it's a very good piece. Uh, you keep giving the wrong numbers if you don't force them to OIA everything. Why is the vaccine rollout so I problematically refute... numerically? Oh, well, I'd, I'd refute that. I mean, we give a weekly update. Yeah, they're wrong. We've always said that what the we'll, update's wrong. Um, That's what the Herald uh, article uh, says. Um, the numbers are incorrect. Well, I would question how it was that the Herald would know more information than what we do coming in for our district health boards. Putting that aside, Mike, we are going to move to more frequent reporting as we scale up the rollout. But our focus in those early days has been just getting people vaccinated um, rather than you know, focusing heavily on reporting systems and dashboards. But we will shift towards more frequent reporting. I think the really important thing is that we've set ourselves... Um, goals around how much of the vaccine we'd have out the door at different points uh, in our timeline. We're at basically 95% of our goals at present, so just shy of them at the moment. But I'm expecting that over the next week we'll, we'll hit 100,000 vaccinated and that will just continue to keep growing. Appreciate your time. Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister.